Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Often in mythology, the word serpent is used to describe snakes, dragons and sea monsters. But the serpent was a symbol for much more than dread. In fact, in Norse and Celtic mythology, it also represented fertility and healing. Its image is often found in wood or runestone carvings. It was thought of as a symbol for protection for warriors. And on one occasion, Odin the Allfather himself transformed into a serpent, so he might enter a cave and drink from the meat of poetry, before taking the form of an eagle and flying away. When we look at Norse myth and legends, there are examples of kennings being used for serpent-like creatures. They describe Fafnir the dragon as the dark trout of the forest, or Loki as the father of the sea thread. There is Nithog, the eater of corpses, a truly terrifying dragon who gnaws at the roots of Yggdrasil, and the gods who in their fury bound Loki to a rock, with poisonous venom of a serpent dripping upon his writhing body. And of course Jormungandr, who we will hear more about in this episode. The serpent can also represent the continual cycle of life. The Ouroboros, which in Greek means tail devourer, is often a snake depicted as swallowing its own tail. The symbol of eternity and infinity can even be found in the tombs of the ancient Egyptians. In Celtic mythology, the serpent is closely associated once more with fertility and healing, the other world, and because of the rippling movement of its body, the snake is also a symbol of water. There is a wonderful story from Celtic mythology that is a good example of the dual nature of how the serpent was perceived. The story concerns the negative side of its image and the son of Morrigan, who is a goddess we will soon be discovering in greater depth in an upcoming episode. It was foretold that Misha would bring disaster to Ireland. He was born with three hearts, one for each manifestation of his mother, and in each heart a serpent lay. When Misha was killed by the hero Dianchecht, the god of healing, One of the serpents escaped and grew into a huge monster, but eventually it was killed at the hands of Dianchek too, thus saving Ireland from disaster. But what myths, legends or folklore have survived in Scotland to this day? We will look to the far distant past, hear a Gaelic poem about an incredible sea monster, and once more travel to the islands where a story awaits its telling. In Scotland, as far north as one might venture, lies the historic county of Caithness. It is home to a rich and varied history, with archaeology teeming with Iron Age forts, brocks, cairns and standing stones that continue to fascinate and enthrall us to this day. It is perhaps unfair to simply say the scenery there is breathtaking. The flatness of the land in contrast to the surrounding highlands, the long sweeping stretches of sandy beaches with high cliffs and impressive sea stacks. But it is not hard to imagine why the Picts and then the Norse settled here where the northernmost point of this country juts out into the Atlantic, and where the Pentland Firth separates the mainland from the islands of Orkney. To cast your eye along the coastline, you will find sea stacks, incredible geos, and a multitude of caves, cliff tops abundant with colonies of seabirds, and the wild sea which was once home to a thriving herring industry. Caithness was home to the ancient kingdom of the Picts, who named it Cait and who were dominant from somewhere in the 5th to the 9th centuries AD, when they began to merge with the gales coming in from the west, and under mounting pressure from the Norse, whose colonies were moving south from the Orkney Islands. The Norse, it would seem, had identified Caithness as a gateway to the Scottish mainland. Their presence first being felt in raiding parties, and their legacy lasting for nearly 300 years, when Caithness was governed by Norse kings and nobles, its sovereignty under dispute between Scotland and the Norwegian earldom of Orkney, until the Treaty of Perth in 1266, when Norway recognised Caithness as being completely Scottish. Though we cannot be denied that the history of this part of Scotland is intriguing, we are here today because of a myth, a legend and folklore, for all three surround this episode as much as the great sea serpent encircles the earth. It is the Midgard serpent Jormungandr, the Kieran Crowen, and the stir worm. These creatures submerged beneath the swell of the sea, their tales still being told to this day. Jormungandr. 
In Old Norse, Jormungandr means huge monster. The Leviathan of the Deep was also referred to as the Midgard Stormer, the Midgard or World Serpent, but not in the Poetic Edda. There, Jormungandr is typically used. There are some wonderful descriptions of this creature from the poems, and some of them I'll share. The Skald Bragi Bodison shield poem Ragnar's Japa, which is the oldest poem we know of in Old Norse and written in the 9th century, describes four scenes carved into a shield given to him by Ragnar Lothbrok. One of these images depicts Thor and the Midgard serpent and contains the oldest confirmed kenning, describing Jormungandr as a side road ship's road string. I could attempt that in Old Norse, but I would probably ruin it completely. This poem gives us an idea of how old the name Jormungandr is. In Snorri Sturluson's Gilfeginning, from the first part of the Prose Edda, we hear how Loki fathered three children with the Jotun giantess Angabotr. The offspring Jormungandr, the Midgard serpent, Hel, the goddess of the underworld, and Fenris, the wolf, are prophesied to cause great mischief and disaster. And because of their mother's nature and the far worse nature of their father Loki, they were to be outcast. The Allfather sent the gods to get the children and bring them to him. And when they came to him, he threw the serpent into that deep sea which lies around all lands. And the serpent grew so that it lies in the midst of the ocean, encircling all lands, and bites its own tail. Perhaps one of the most well known stories of Jormungandr can be found in Hemskvitha or Hymir's poem, where Thor, the son of Odin, uses the head of an ox to bait the serpent from the deep. These stanzas are read from Dr. Jackson Crawford's translation of the Poetic Edda. Thor, friend of the humans, enemy of the serpent, put the ox's head on his hook. Then the gaping Midgard serpent came up, the one that hates the gods and lives in the encircling sea. The bold Thor pulled bravely to bring that poison slick serpent up on board. With his hammer he struck a blow on the head of Fenrir's serpent brother. The monster howled, volcanoes erupted, and the old earth trembled all over. But that sea monster sank back into the waves. Another myth many of us have heard and find utterly enthralling is that of Ragnarok, the final destiny and twilight of the gods, and where Thor comes against Jormungandr. The Voluspa, or the Prophecy of the Sirius, is one of my favourite mythological poems in which a Sirius tells of her visions and prophecies at the behest of Odin the Allfather. This wonderful poem takes us from creation to the Aesir and the Vanir, the tragedy of Baldur's death, and onward towards Ragnarok. In Noah Tetzner's The Poetic Edda Study Guide, of the battle between Thor, the son of Odin, and Jormungandr, the offspring of Loki, he writes, Thor fights the Midgard serpent and successfully defeats it. During the fight, he is sprayed by the serpent's venom, and after taking nine steps backward, falls dead. Darkness falls upon creation, and Midgard sinks into the sea. Of the section which he so accurately describes, I will read from Professor Caroline Larrington's translation. Then comes Odin's glorious boy. Odin's son advances to fight the serpent. He strikes in wrath Midgard's protector. All men must abandon their homesteads. Nine steps Fjorgen's child takes, exhausted from the serpent which fears no shame. The sun turns black, land sinks into the sea. The bright stars vanish from the sky. Loden and Fjörgen and actually Jord are the names given to the mother of Thor. In Scandinavian folklore, sea serpents are said to breed in inland lakes and eventually when they are old enough and strong enough, they make for open sea. I actually have two interesting um, folklore tales for you and they come from Norway. Once a sea serpent was lying across a fjord, thereby closing it to ships and boats so that there was no way to get into town. They put sharp iron prongs on the bows of their ships and tried to kill or chase the sea serpent away. They managed to injure it, colouring the water blood red, but they could not get it out. They did not know what to do except hold a prayer meeting at church. From all the pulpits, prayers were said to free the town from this calamity. Then a seahorse emerged from the ocean and there was a fight to the death with it and the sea serpent. In the end, the serpent let out a terrible howl and disappeared into the sea. 
the seahorse followed it, and since then no one has seen either one of them. That story was collected in 1931. This next piece of folklore was collected in 1929. People believed that there were monsters on the bottom of the ocean. They would surface taking boats, people and fish back into the depths with them. When they surfaced, they would first rise slowly and then they would shoot up and collapse like a breaker. Once a man was out in his boat, fishing with a handline, he paddled to a place where he knew there were a lot of fish. He hardly got the bait on his hook before he caught one. But after sitting there for a while, he noticed that the water was becoming more and more shallow. He thought that this was very strange. He looked towards land to see whether he had drifted and lost his bearings. But no, his position was exactly where it should be. It must be old Eric himself, he said. And hurriedly pulled up his line and rode away fast as he could. And it was high time too. As soon as he got away, the waves crashed around him as if he had run into the worst breaker. He had encountered a sea monster. There were always a lot of fish just above it, but if a fisherman does not get away before the monster breaks through the surface of the water, he is doomed. Certainly the imagery conjured up from the poems of Jormungandr is quite sinister. The very idea of a creature of such immense size that it encircles the world and biting its own tail, thrown into the sea by Odin himself and whose venom causes the death even to the mighty Thor. It is enough to place fear in the heart of any who ventured out upon the sea in a time when myths, the gods and monsters were very real. It is possible then to understand how these myths might become so wonderfully entangled with the culture and folklore of the people and places the Norse visited and the places they settled in and once called home. So then, to another monster of the deep and creatures who bear more than a passing resemblance to the Midgard serpent. At the beginning of the episode, I gave you a very short history of Caithness and the body of water called the Pentland Firth that separates the mainland from Orkney, the islands. In Caithness, the legend of the Ciaran Croan is found, surviving in Gaelic folklore and verse. Seven herring are a salmon's fill, seven salmon are a seal's fill, seven seals are a whale's fill, and seven whales are the fill of a Ciaran Croan. Sometimes you might find an extra line that's added and it reads, Seven Ciaran Croan are the fill of the great beast of the ocean. In local folklore, it is said that this sea-dwelling creature, described as a large sea monster, is in fact the largest animal in the world. It's capable of feasting on whales that could also disguise itself or shapeshift into a small silver fish, thereby fooling fishermen who came across it. And once in this form, it then gave itself the means to trap and secure its next meal. This is not the first occasion a monster of this size appears in mythology or folklore of a Celtic culture. In the destruction of Dadurga's Hostel, which is an Irish tale belonging to the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology, it concerns the birth, life and death of Conor Moore and the gaze that he breaks through circumstance and fate. And gaze are essentially vows or oaths. A character named Mekecht utters this line upon the destruction that they witness. I know nothing like it, unless it be the earth that has broken, or the leviathan that surrounds the globe and strikes with its tail to overturn the world. There is the suggestion that the Cairn Croan was in fact a large whirlpool, and this would account for men being lost at sea once their vessel was within its pool. The tides of the Pentland Firth are renowned for their strength, and are said to be among some of the fastest in the world. A tidal race is a naturally occurring, fast-moving tide which passes through a constriction. This results in waves, eddies and precarious currents. One such tidal race is called the Swelkey. The race at the north of Stroma Island, which lies within the channel of the Firth, extends from Swelkey Point and can run either easterly or westerly depending on the tide. It can be of a particularly dangerous and violent nature. Here there is a whirlpool called the Swelke, which in Old Norse was called Svalga. This translates as swallower, which seems apt for a whirlpool of its size and ferocity. The Swelke and the Pentland Firth are mentioned in the Orkneyanga saga no less than 20 times, depending on the translation. There is a wonderful tale about whirlpools and why the sea is salty in Grotesonger, or the Song of Groti. It tells us about two giantesses 
Fenya and Menya, and the giant stone mill called Grotti that grinds out everything that is desired. The women are sold as slaves to the Danish king Frothi and set to work on the mill. Throughout the poem, we learn of their former lives and deeds, and in despair and rage at their situation, they turn against Frothi and grind out everything that they would need to fight him, such as weapons and an army. But the fate of the woman takes another turn when a Viking or sea king by the name of Mysing kills Frothi and takes Fenya, Menya and Grotti aboard his ship. Mysing orders the woman to grind salt for him. They grind out so much that the weight of it causes his ship to sink, the sea to become salty and the whirlpool a result of the movement of the mill as it sinks. The island of Stroma in the Pentland Firth is now abandoned, but there are remains of standing stones an ancient Norse fortification on a sea stack, and the empty homes of the fishermen and crofters who once lived on this land that at times was isolating and often perilous. The Pentland Firth, which is between six and eight miles wide and 17 miles in length, is home not only of whirlpools, eddies and currents, but of a myth, legend and history. As we sail these waters from Caithness, past the islands of Stroma, Swona and the Skerries, we arrive in Orkney where, as we have heard, many a sea creature dwells. But now I will tell you of another, one that goes by the name of the Stour Worm. Orkney has a staggering amount of history to explore. From the 5th century AD, there is evidence of the island being occupied. The Picts are thought to have arrived in the 7th century, and it was a stronghold until the arrival of the Norse in the 9th century. There is a lovely description of the Orkney and Shetland Islands, made by Ernest Marwick, in his book on folklore of the Isles. He writes, It might be said that these northern isles came gradually out of a haze of romantic tradition. They lay in dragon green and serpent haunted seas. Indeed, the oldest stories say they were the teeth that fell from the greatest of all serpents, the stour worm, in his death agony. I think that paragraph gives us a sense of how islanders might have felt on islands surrounded by fathomless rough and stormy waters, the sea frothing and crashing into the rock with cliff faces, stone and shoreline, far enough away from the mainland to be keepers of their own history and the tellers of such wonderful lore. Indeed, Marwick described the Midgard serpent as a primordial monster whose coils encircled the earth and commenting on an old Shetland belief concerning the cause of the tides. Away far out to sea, near the edge of the world, lived a monstrous sea serpent that took six hours to draw in breath and six to let it out. But what does Arcadian folklore tell us about the stour worm? Well, it was certainly a creature to be feared. Of immense size, it was also described as having revolting breath, blighting every growing thing, whether it be man, animal or plant. It was kept at bay by a sacrifice of seven young maidens to his appetite every seven days. It could destroy land, ships and dwellings with its forked tongue. Great waves and swells were said to be the beast yawning. There is a hero in the tale of the stour worm who goes by a rather interesting name of Asipatl, which translates to ash waker or ash paddle. This name essentially describes a youth who might lie beside a fire idly poking the embers. In Norwegian folktales, Asklad or Ashlad is used in much the same way. As always, I will end the episode with a piece of myth, legend or lore, and today I will narrate for you Asipatl and the stour worm. But I also have the joy of including the song Something with Rocks and Water from the album The Celtic Room by the wonderfully talented Ian Ventova. The Celtic Room is a real standout body of work for me. The number of instruments, melodies and themes in every song transports the listener into a living, breathing world of folk music. You will find yourself spirited away, and especially so with Something with Rocks and Water. I feel it concludes today's episode wonderfully as we continue with our creatures and beings from the sea. I will include links to Ian's website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube in the episode description and of course on my own Twitter and Facebook. So then, to Asipatl and the Stour Worm. Asipatl was the youngest of seven sons. He lived with his father and mother and brothers, on a fine farm beside a burn. They all worked hard, except Asipatl, who could be persuaded to do little. He lay beside the big open fire in the farm kitchen, 
caring nothing that he became covered with ash. His father and mother shook their heads over him. His brothers cursed him for a fool and kicked him. Everyone hooted with mirth when Asipatl told of an evening stories of incredible battles in which he was the hero. One day, awful news reached the farm. It was said that the muckle meester Sturerworm was coming close to land. The Sturerworm was the most dreaded creature in all the world. People grew pale and crossed themselves when they heard his name, for he was the worst kind of nine fearful curses that plagued mankind. If the earth shook and the sea swept over the fields, it was the Sturerworm yawning. He was so long that there was no place for his body until he coiled it around the earth. His breath was so venomous that when he was angry and blew out a great blast of it, every living thing within reach was destroyed, and all the crops were withered. With his forked tongue, he would sweep hills and villages into the sea, or seize and crush a house or ship so that he could devour the people inside. When he came close to the country where Azipato lived and began to yawn, the people knew that he must be fed, otherwise he would get into a rage and destroy the whole land. The news was that the king had consulted a wise man, a spayman, about what had to be done. After thinking a while, the spayman said that the only way to keep the storeroom happy was to feed him on young virgins, seven of them each week. The people were horrified by this, but the danger was so appalling that they consented. Every Saturday morning, seven terrified girls were bound hand and foot and laid on a rock beside the shore. Then the monster raised his head from the sea and seized them with the fork of his tongue, and they were seen no more. As they listened to what the king's messenger, who had brought the news, had to tell, the faces of Asipatl's father and brothers grew grey, and when they trembled, Asipatl declared he was ready to fight the monster. All through the years he bragged he had been saving his strength just for this. His brothers were furious and pelted him with stones, but his father said sadly, It's likely you'll fight the stir worm when I make spoons from the horns of the moon. There were even more dreadful things for the messenger to relate. He said that the people of the country were so horrified by the deaths of the loveliest and most innocent girls that they demanded some other remedy. Once again, the king consulted the spayman, who declared at long last, with terror in his eyes, that the only way to persuade the monster to depart was to offer him the most beautiful girl in the land, the Princess Gem de Lovely, the king's only child. Gem de Lovely was the king's heir, and he loved her more than anyone else. But the people were so frantic with grief at the loss of their own children that the king said, with tears rolling down his cheeks, it is surely a wonderful thing that the last of the oldest race in the land, who is descended from the great god Odin, should die for her folk. There was only one possible way of saving the princess, so the king asked for sufficient time to send messengers to every part of his realm. They were to announce that the princess would become the wife of any man who was strong enough and brave enough to fight the monster and overcome him. The wedding gift to the champion would be the kingdom itself, and the famous sword Sicker Snapper that the king had inherited from Odin. Thirty champions had come to the palace, said the messenger, but only twelve of them remained after they had seen the stir worm. Even they were sick with fear. It was certain that the king had no faith in them. Old and feeble as he was, he had taken the sword Sicker Snapper out of the chest behind the high table and had sworn that he would fight the monster himself rather than let his daughter be destroyed. His boat was pulled down from its noust and was anchored near the shore so as it would be ready when he needed it. Asipatl listened eagerly to all of this, but no one heeded him. The messenger mounted his horse and slowly rode away. Soon the father and mother went to bed. From where he lay in the ashes beside the flickering fire, Asipatl heard them saying that they would go the next day to see the fight between the king and the monster. They would write Titgong, who was the swiftest horse in the land. How was it that Tikong could be made to gallop faster than any other horse? asked the mother. It was a long time before Asipata's father would tell her, but at last, worn out by her questions, he said, When I want Tikong to stand, I give him a clap on the left shoulder. When I want him to run quickly, I give him two claps on the right shoulder. And when I want him to gallop as fast as he can go, 
I blow through the thrapple of a goose that I always keep in my pocket. He has only to hear that, and he goes like the wind. After a while, there was a silence, and Asipatl knew that they were asleep. Very quietly, he pulled the goose thrapple out of his father's pocket. He found his way to the stable, where he tried to bridle Titgong. At first, the horse kicked and reared, but when Asipatl patted him on his left shoulder, he was as still as a mouse. When Asipatl got on his back and patted his right shoulder, he started off with a loud neigh. The noise wakened the father, who sprang up and called his sons. All of them mounted their best horses that they could find and set off in pursuit after the thief, knowing little that it was Asipatl. The father who rode the fastest almost overtook Tikgong and shouted to him, Tikgong, whoa! At that, Tikgong came to a halt. Asipatl put the goose thrapple in his mouth and blew as hard as he could. When Tikgong heard the sound, he galloped away like the wind, leaving his master and the six sons far behind. The speed was such that Asipatl could hardly breathe. It was almost dawn when Asipatl reached the coast where the stewer worm was lying. There was a dale between the hills. In the dale, there was a small croft house. Asipatl tethered his horse and slipped into the croft. An old woman lay in bed, snoring loudly. The fire had been rested, and an iron pot stood beside it. Asipatl seized the pot. In it, he placed a glowing peat from the fire. The woman did not waken, as he quietly crept out of the house. But the grey cat, which lay at the bottom of her bed, yawned and stretched itself. Down to the shore, Asipatl hurried. Far out from the land, there was a dark, high island, which was really the top of the stirworm's head, but close to the shore, a boat was rocking at anchor. A man stood up from the boat, beating flukes, for it was cold that morning. Asipatl shouted to the man, Why don't you come on shore to warm yourself? I would if I could, replied the man, but the king's camperman would thrash me black and blue if I left the boat. You had better stay then, said Asipatl. A whole skin is better than a sark full of sore bones. As for myself, I'm going to light a fire and cook limpets for my breakfast. And he began to dig a hollow in the ground for a fireplace. He dug for a minute or two, then jumped up crying, Gold! It must be gold! It's yellower than the corn and brighter than the sun! When the man in the boat heard this, he jumped into the water and waded ashore. He almost knocked Asipatl down, so anxious as he was to see the gold. With his bare hands, he scratched at the earth where Asipatl had been digging. Meanwhile, Asipatl untied the painter and sprang into the boat with the pot in his hand. He was well out to sea when the man looked up from his digging and began to roar with Madrim. The sun appeared like a red ball over the end of the valley as Asipatl hoisted the sail and steered towards the head of the monster. When he looked, he could see that the king and all his men had gathered on the shore. Some of them were dancing with fury, bawling at him to come back. He paid no heed, knowing that he must reach the stir worm before the creature gave its seventh yawn. The stir worm's head was like a mountain with eyes like round locks, so deep and very dark. When the sun shone in his eyes, the monster wakened and began to yawn. He always gave seven long yawns, then his dreadful forked tongue shot out and seized any living thing that happened to be near. Asipatl steered close to the monster's mouth as he yawned a second time. With each yawn, a vast tide of water was swept down the stirworm's gullet. Asipatl and his boat were carried along with it into the mighty cavern of its mouth, then down the throat and along twisting passages like tremulous tunnels. Mile after mile he whirled, with the water gurgling around him. At last the force of the current grew less, and the water got shallower, and the boat grounded. Asipatl knew he had only a short while before the next yawn, so he ran as he had never run in his life, and around one corner after another, until he came to the stirworm's liver. He could see that what it was about, because all inside of the monster was lit up by miracles. He pulled out a muckle ragger and cut a hole into the liver. Then he took the peat out of the pail and pushed it into the hole, blowing for all he was worth to make it burst into flame. He thought the fire would never take, and had almost given up hope, when there was a tremendous blaze and the liver began to burn and sputter like a John Smith's bonfire. 
When he was sure that the whole liver would soon be burning, Asipatl ran back to his boat. He ran even faster than he had ever done before, and he reached it just in time, for the burning liver made the stewer worm so ill that it retched and retched. A flood of water from the stomach caught the boat and carried it up the monster's throat and out of his mouth, and right to the shore where he landed high and dry. Although Asipatl was safe and sound, no one had any thought for him, for it seemed that the end of the world had come. Bigger and bigger grew the fire. Black clouds of smoke swirled from the monster's nostrils, so that the sky was filled with darkness. In his agony, he shot out his forked tongue until it laid hold of the horn of the moon. But it slipped off and fell with such a tridad that it made a deep rift in the earth. The tide rushed into the rift between Danesland and Noroa. The place where the end of the tongue fell is the Baltic Sea. The stewerworm twisted and turned in torment. He flung his head up to the sky, and every time it fell, the whole world shook and groaned. With each fall, teeth dropped out of the vile, spewing mouth. The first lot became the Orkney Islands, the next became the Shetland Islands, and last of all, when the stewerworm was nearly dead, the Faroe Islands fell with an almighty splash into the sea. In the end, the monster coiled himself tightly together into a huge mass. Old folks say that the far country of Iceland is the dead body of the stir worm, with the liver still blazing beneath its burning mountains. After a long while, the sky cleared and the sun shone, and the people came to themselves again. On top of the hill, the king took Asipatl in his arms and called him his son. He dressed Asipatl in a crimson robe, and put the fair white hand of the Gem de Lovely into the hand of Asipatl. Then he girded the sword Sicker Snapper on Asipatl. And he said that as far as the kingdom stretched north, south, east and west, everything belonged to the hero who had saved the land and its people. A week later, Asipatl and Gem de Lovely were married in the royal palace. Never was there such a wedding, for everyone in the kingdom was happy that the stir worm would never trouble them again. All over the country there was singing and dancing. King Asipatl and Queen Gem de Lovely were full of joy, for they loved one another so much. They had ever so many fine burns, and if they are not dead, they are living yet. <laughs> Thank you.
very much hope you enjoyed the song Something With Rocks and Water by Ian Puntova. As always, you can contact me by email mlegendlore at gmail.com or at lore myth on Twitter. I'm Siobhan Clark. This is the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Thank you for listening.